we are excited to present three different talks today. Uh, so these are three projects related to flooding, uh, very appropriate for today. Hopefully it'll be insightful uh, for you all as well. Um, so I'm Kaushik, uh, I'm a data scientist at Data Clinic. Uh, we have Ricardo Toledo Crow, who is a research professor at the Advanced Science Research Center, which is part of CUNY, and some of his colleagues as well from College of Staten Island. And then we have Ashley Louie, who was here, but she'll be back. Uh, and one of our colleagues from Beta NYC um, were also presenting a, a, a tool that they're working on. Uh, so these are kind of like lightning talks. Uh, we're gonna do three quick sessions, about 10, 12 minutes each. Uh, and have all the questions at the end. Uh, all of these are related to flooding and the challenges of flooding in the city, um, uh, particularly in terms of how do we advocate for uh, building better resilience to, to flooding. Once again, we did not plan for it to be such a rainy day today, uh, but uh, you know, it so happens uh, to be it. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to Ricardo to get us started on uh, some of the work uh, him and his colleagues are doing um, on understanding flooding in the city. Okay, thank you, Koshik. So hello, everybody, and thank you so much for this opportunity to present uh, our work in, uh, in what is really a scaffolding for an urban compound flood model using a number of data sets that are openly available, as well as some tools uh, that are open source uh, for this purpose. And this is a group of us from, from the City University of New York, um, College of Staten Island, Advanced Science Research Center, and Hunter College. Um, and I have been working for uh, the past four years in something called the FloodNet dot NYC project. So I'm going to be referring to the, a lot of that, that project and data. And I want to plug my colleague, uh, Charlie Midlars, this afternoon is going to be presenting the entire project in one of the talks. Okay, so the big, big picture of what we're trying to do, again, uh, here on the, on the left-hand side, we have the model itself. So it's, uh, you know, it's the hydraulics, the, hydro, uh, the hydrology, um, the, the, the engineering part. Um, and this, this model it takes in historical flood data as well as meteorological and forecasting data, and it tries to come up with a prediction. So it updates the prediction of where and when things might happen. That information would go on then to uh, the city agencies for planning and action. It would also go to the uh, communities that are at risk of flooding as, as warnings and, and uh, advisories. Um, but the important and the novel aspect here is that now we have this thing called FloodNet the sensors that are now uh, providing data that we can then compare with the prediction and then do a correction to the model. So we have this feedback loop, which I'll be uh, coming back to a, a number of times. I also have this line here where I have community engagement, which is a very important source of information as well. And community, this is in the, in the biggest sense possible. It could be neighborhood associations or it could be the media. And all of this is feeding back into the model in a constant loop loop of updating uh, the prediction and, as we'll see later, the possibility of actually modifying the network itself. All right, so we, we have three initial, uh, we're going to do this in hopefully three steps. The initial step, what we call the sandbox, is that we're working on the campus of the College of Staten Island in, in, in the central uh, part of Staten Island. And we start there because that's where we have most of the information, that we have a lot of the, the, the um, the, uh, the infrastructure information there. And then uh, the next step will be to take it in some of the uh, flood prone areas of, of Staten Island. The, there are a lot of them. And li uh, lastly, we would obviously like to take this uh, to a, a scale for the whole city. All right, so our main tool for this is something called the Stormwater Management Model, or SWIM. It's a, it's, a, it's a piece of software. It's a package that was built by the EPA, and it's about over 50 years old by now, so it's very well debugged, very well uh, understood, and maybe a lot of you have either used it or parts of it or different iterations of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it has a number of objects in it that makes it very useful. Uh, you know, we think, have things like green roofs, um, uh, sweat, uh, the porous pavement, so all of that can be incorporated into these objects of, of the SWIM model. And by now, since it's been around, it's open, there are about you know, 14, 15 or more um, uh, platforms that actually use it. And in our case, we'll be using the EPA SWIM model, the original one, as well as something called PySwim, which I understand is a, is a wrapper pretty much of, of the EPA. 
Okay, the parts of the model, and bear with me on this complicated slide. So it has some sources and sinks of water. Up here on the, on the top left, we have the precipitation, which is probably the, the main uh, source of water for the model. Uh, it goes into the model itself here, called the initial abstraction, where we have the hydrology, hydraulic, uh, hydraulics, and then anything that doesn't go into the, into the, to the pipe, so to speak, will be runoff, um, and then that can go into yet another, uh, one of the first sinks of, of water, which are what we call the low impact developments, which again are the, bio, the swales, the, the trenches, all those kinds of developments that can be deployed to manage um, floods. Uh, and the other, the other sink will be evaporation and infiltration into the ground. Uh, into the groundwater. So these are the two main sinks. Now we have other sources that go into this model. Uh, the bottom right has the rainfall dependent inflow and infiltration. And those can be breaches in the, in the sewer system where groundwater or even sanitary flows might be entering the system. And then on the left, we have obviously the sanitary flows and those are very important in your city. They might be combining with the, with the storm water in, in the combined sewers or not, you know, depending on where you are in the city. Uh, and then this last box called the buildup, and that's where you can actually input the uh, parts from other such systems like this. So you can actually join these modules together to make a bigger, a, 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 a bigger system. All right, so jumping into what we're doing at the college, here we have aerial view of the college and surrounding college campus and surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, from the di digital elevation model files, we got the, the, the subcatchments where, where water would be flowing. And we will be focusing only on S2 and S5, which are the ones that actually correspond to the, to the college. And here you, you have the outline of the college. And to the left, we have uh, Willowbrook Park and Lake, where there, there is the capacity for water accumulation. And then farther went to the west is the Freshkill wetland. And this is all in central Staten Island. Uh, so, so these are really the, 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 the elements of the model. We have S2 and S5, the subcatchments. We have the input, which is the Mesonet uh, weather station right in the middle of the campus. And then we have one of the flood net sensors on the output on what was called the pore point, where all of the water will be uh, passing and, and, and thus measured. And that's a photo of the sensor itself. It's on a, it's right at the culvert that goes below the road into the, into the into the lake, uh, Willowbrook Lake area. And and you see it there on, on the right. It's attached to one of the uh, USGS uh, stream sensors that hasn't been working for a number of years. Okay, so from open data, uh, this is one of the data sets that we're using. This is the, the catch basins. And it's important to note that uh, there are several of them in that S2 subcatchment area that, that we defined. And I want you to keep those in mind because we will consider them separately. Uh, so these are um, the catchments that are going into the, into the sewer system of the city. Um, here we have uh, data from the uh, average impermeability uh, data set, and I will mention all the data sets that we use at the end, and we can discuss those uh, offline. Um, and now, if you remember, we, we actually divided S2 into four parts, and the reason we did this is because, as you can see, there's a number of, of these catch basins inside this, this uh, subcatch, and we are going to exclude them from our calculations because we know that water is being diverted out of our system. So we're actually just going to be using S2A, D, and C here. Um, and then lastly, we have the data set that gives us the average slope, or the percentage slope, which we'll also put into the system. And thus, thus these are like the, 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 the main uh, parameters of the system that we calculate for all these subcatchments, uh, the area, the percent imperviousness, and the percent slope. So these all go into, into our model. And these are the data, the data sets. Uh, we can go over them um, offline, but we have uh, some restricted data sets, mainly Mesonet and Micronet, which are the, 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 the precipitation, the weather information. And then, of course, from the College of Staten Island, we got uh, information about the, the, the sewer lines and the, 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 the drains, the sewer drains. And so all of that is, is, is not 
not publicly available. But the open source data sets obviously are the, the digital elevation models, the permeability uh, surface type, and the surface types as well as the catch basins. And then the open source software that we use is the EPA SWIM, the PySwim, and some other tools, ArcPy and MATLAB, which are not necessarily open. All right, so see, this is some, a couple of examples of the results that we have. So on the top here in blue, we have the rainfall from the Mesonet station. In red in the middle, we have the output of the swim model. And at the bottom in light blue, we have the actual data from the sensor itself. And you can see this is over a number of days uh, early in January last year. Uh, we, we get a pretty much good approximation to, to the flood uh, measurements. We, we still have some some aspects of it that we're not catching. However, if we go into a single day, like uh, this is September, end of September last year, we had the that, uh, remnants of, of, of the storm that caused so much flooding. And we see that indeed in this case, we do start to see a little bit of the, 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 the features of the flood itself, uh, including the slight uh, delay in time from the mesonet uh, information. So these are, these are the data, the kind of data, the, the results that we're seeing. Okay, so now I'm going to jump briefly to um, an example of the data that we're getting with the flood net. And what I'm showing here is the elevation on the Midland Beach area of Staten Island. It's an extremely flat area and it's at sea level. And so it's, it's very prone to flooding. Um, the city has a development there called the New Creek Brew Belt, where it took uh, one of the waterways there and it actually enhances its water management capacities. And those dots in red are some of the sensors that we have around the area. Unfortunately, we're not able to put them before the development, which would have been great to do a before and after comparison. But this is the kind of data that we are picking up. Again, this was uh, late September last year. And, and this is an event. This is a, the, the, the typical signature of an event. So in light gray there, you have the rainfall. And on that day, you can see uh, on the left, we have the location of the sensors. And on the, on, on the right, you have the, 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 sensor, the sensor depth of flooding reported, as well as the rainfall. You see that at 4 o'clock in the morning, we have the first cloud burst, and we start seeing uh, a flood uh, accumulate at the lowest uh, on this sensor here, which is at the lowest point of this waterway, which is the blue, the, the New Creek Blue Belt, uh, and it grows and it stabilizes. And then at 7:20 in the morning, there's the second cloud burst, and then you start seeing the floods on all of the other sensors. Uh, so that's a good two and a half hours, uh, two and a half hours uh, delay. So this gives us a lot of opportunities to do forecasting, uh, especially if we can do a, a holistic analysis of these sensors. So just to go, come back to this idea of having the data inputs, the model, and then res and the comparison with with the with the flood sensors as in a, in, a, in a feedback loop. Uh, I'm going I'm to wrap up with this picture, which is like the status, the current status of the flood net network. It's, we have about 100 sensors out there. Uh, these are dots in red. The dots in, in the, the other dots represent uh, a, a rain, rain gauges or, or weather stations. So we have actually a very nice coverage of the city. The intent is to grow the number of flood, nets to, uh, flood net sensors to 500. And this will give us the opportunity of making a very nice uh, node-based network. So if we have 600 nodes, that is a total of about 180,000 connections, very manageable in today's uh, type of uh, computing facilities. And uh, we expect to be able to both verify the, the quality of the data as well as to do the predictions that we're looking for. Okay, thank you. Uh, cool. Um, so jumping on to the next one, um, uh, I'm Kaushik. I'm part of the data clinic team. Uh, we do some pro bono work with mission-driven organizations, providing data science and engineering support. And we've been interested in the topic of, of flooding, uh, particularly in the context of how it impacts uh, transit, public transit in the city. Um, but also, we've been in conversations with, with the FloodNet team since late last year. Uh, and we thought, given some of our experience working with open data, particularly transit data, how we can supplement and uh, support uh, you know, this sort of understanding of flooding in the city. So 
why are we even doing this, right? Like putting flood net sensors everywhere and trying to measure flooding because getting a very granular understanding of flooding, uh, how it occurs in the city is really hard. Uh, you have these large models, you have data from FEMA and other things which are fairly wide and broad, uh, but it doesn't give you a very narrow perspective. Is this particular street going to flood uh, for a particular type of storm? And that is what Floodnet and the team, uh, um, Ricardo and others, are trying to solve. Like, can you actually, using the sensor data, build a model that will help us understand at a very granular level what flooding would look like in, in our city, not just now, but in taking into account sea level rise and challenges with draining water out and so on. Um, the New York City DEP also has a stormwater flooding model, which takes into account these sort of sea level rise scenarios. And then there's another organization called First Street Foundation, which has a, a flood risk factor, uh, which is sort of a composite model. It takes into account data from FEMA and a bunch of other sources and creates sort of estimates of which properties are more likely to flood. Uh, so our question and, and where we come in, uh, you know, our question was, can open data supplement this process in any way, right? Like we have all of these, obviously like FloodNet and the project is fantastic, but it's an infrastructure challenge. You need to set up these sensors in a lot of places, it takes time, it takes money to like scale this. We hope you know, it'll get there sooner rather than later. Uh, but can we, in the meanwhile, supplement this um, information with other open data sets? Uh, so this is where we sort of thought, OK, we want to try and understand which roads are going to flood. Uh, and New York City has a pretty fantastic transit system. Uh, this is, the, for example, the bus uh, map of Brooklyn, which spans most of the streets, right, in Brooklyn. There are maybe not 100% coverage, but a lot of Brooklyn is covered by these bus routes. Uh, and data about buses is public. So can we actually look at how buses are moving through traffic on a, on a rainy day and figure out where there might be challenges with respect to flooding or stagnation or just disruption in general uh, due, to, due to storms? Uh, so the real-time bus data is called GTFS. Um, this is what uh, you know feeds your uh, timetables on that you see in subway stations, the bus time app, and and so on. Uh, this gives us like minute by minute locations of buses, uh, which route the bus is on, which trip it's on, what time is it, and what's its coordinate. Uh, this is available live from MTA's API, uh, but uh, very. A uh, good person at, uh, at uh, Cornell Tech, uh, Anthony Townsend, who I need to shout out uh, Noel there, who connected us with them, uh, has archived this data for a long time, right? So there's the Bus Observatory API, uh, which you can use to basically get historical bus locations, uh, which help with analysis like this. Um, so in, in this talk, I'm going to focus in on, on one week of data. So this is uh, September, seven, one and a half weeks, let's say, uh, 17 to the 30th, because this covers the, the storm that we had on September 29th last year, where Brooklyn received four and a half inches of rainfall in under three hours, and there were severe like consequences because of that. So our goal was, can we actually detect this happening uh, through data from the MTA, uh, which is all open, which is all public? The first thing we did was, OK, uh, MTA sends out alerts, and this is also public. Uh, are there actually alerts when buses are, bus routes are getting disrupted, or if a bus is rerouting or service is stopping? Um, but what we saw was uh, these were typically very broad alerts saying, we caution people in Brooklyn, there's severe rain, buses might be stuck, buses might be uh, you know, rerouting, or uh, there's reduced service. Uh, so it doesn't give you a very narrow understanding of what's going on. They also appear with a delay. So the rain started around 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the first alerts came around noon. Uh, so it doesn't actually map to when the, the uh, flooding is, is starting. And it doesn't, like I said, help identify specific locations. So the next thing we looked at was uh, bus speeds. Uh, so we have the positions of all the buses for every minute. Uh, and the hypothesis is, if there is actually flooding on the streets, then this would disrupt movement of traffic. Uh, fairly big hypothesis, but maybe not so much for severe storms, right? And we can calculate this real time. So we can calculate how fast a bus is moving at any given point in time. And it helps us identify specific street segments where a bus's behavior is different from what it might typically be. Uh, 
going one step beyond, uh, this is not something that we haven't worked on yet, but uh, we want to try and understand our buses forced to read out in, in these scenarios. Like, uh, is there a deviation in the route they take from what is supposed to be a bus's uh, path? Uh, slightly harder to figure out, but something we hope to work on. So uh, based on doing this analysis, again, this is fairly rough because it's our first iteration. We hope to clean this up and, and make it more robust. But we looked at sort of roughly the average bus speeds uh, after noon of the storm, which is on the 29th, and compared it to the previous Friday, uh, which was a sunny day. Uh, so like a rough estimate or approximation of what is typical. And we saw that on the day of the storm, uh, in general, there was a slowdown across the city. So all the buses everywhere in the city were moving roughly 10 to 15% slower than their speeds a week before. And specifically in a couple of parts of Brooklyn, so uh, Williamsburg, Flatbush, and further down, uh, there was much higher uh, sort of slowdown or disruption, essentially, with buses running really nearly 40% slower. Uh, a caveat to this is, uh, this kind of surprised us, um, is there was actually much lower service as well on this day. So I think at some point, the MTA decided that, uh, you know, the, Buses are getting stuck, so we got to reduce service. So in the four-hour period from 10 to 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., the number of buses out on the streets were like roughly half or, or three-fourths of a uh, typical Friday. Uh, so that's a little bit of a nuance when, when trying to use this data to detect uh, flooding. All right, so uh, zooming in further, obviously the reason why we're doing this is to get very granular information. Uh, I don't know how easy it is to see with the contrast and stuff, but this is a street map of Brooklyn uh, where the yellow streets are where we saw the greatest deviation in terms of bus speeds. Uh, and the more green and purple you get to, that's where you have uh, fairly similar um, uh, speeds as, as a uh, Friday before. Um, and this matches up with what we saw and what we know uh, in terms of reports that came out, uh, you know, parts of Williamsburg, parts of Flatbush, uh, some other streets um, in Brooklyn where we saw reports of, of flooding and disruption. Uh, but, you know, this is sort of a first pass at it. Uh, we are somewhat happy with the results, but obviously we can, you know, con continue to work on it and, and improve the, the analysis. Um, some of the most disrupted bus routes were the B48, B70, B8, B61. Uh, I'll talk about this very briefly in a little bit. The cool thing is we, we can't do this just for like, you know, Brooklyn. Uh, it's very easy to scale this analysis to the whole city. Uh, so this is a picture of Staten Island and, and what disruptions look like or, or slowdowns look like on specific street segments uh, on Staten Island and Manhattan and South Bronx as well with uh, the bus routes that were most impacted here. Uh, obviously, this analysis was done for one week, so it's not very robust, uh, but this is sort of you know, our first attempt at trying to do something like this, and the goal is to you know, continuously iterate and improve, uh, improve this work. All right, so why did we actually like get into this? Um, so this talk is about flooding and flood resilience in the city, right? And understanding where floods occur or are more likely to occur is only one part of the equation. Uh, end of the day, like resilience is about how it impacts people and, and how it disrupts, not transit, but people's lives, right? So in the context of transit, we wanted to try and understand what this means for commuters. And this is something that we had already worked on um, over the last year in collaboration with the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, we've been building a tool called TREK, uh, which looks at transit resiliency during climate events. Um, in particular, we want to understand how does transit support important destinations for commuters? So looking at does a transit stop, say a bus stop, get people to a hospital or a health center? How many jobs are around a particular transit stop that people would need access to to get to their jobs? That, who does it primarily serve? Like, is this in a neighborhood with a lot of vulnerable uh, populations uh, or looking at general vulnerability overall? And that's the goal, which is with a granular understanding of climate risks for New York City, it's flooding, along with data on uh, what are the important locations? Where do people need to go to work? Who needs to go? Like, who is actually, uh, you know, be made vulnerable by the scenario? Putting those two pieces together helps us better understand 
locations and, and areas that need to be targeted in terms of building greater resilience. So I showed B48 as one of the routes that was most affected in Brooklyn because it goes through Flatbush up into Williamsburg. So it was you know, one of the most disrupted uh, routes. And we see specific sort of locations, might be a bit hard to see, but you can uh, go to the website and check it out, which are the dark red dots. Uh, those are the places which have high risk of flooding and also uh, provide high access to a hospital or a health center. Uh, so if someone, you know, who, is, who, who couldn't uh, afford to take a cab and needed to go to a hospital and it's flooding and it's raining and they need to take a bus, this bus route is not probably not very accessible to them because everything was slowed down that day by over, you know, 50%. Uh, so that's the idea. This is one step in, in this sort of journey towards trying to understand the impact of climate risks on, on, on communities. Um, I already spoke a little bit about this in terms of uh, you know, refining this analysis a bit more, uh, getting a more robust understanding of what typical bus speeds are, uh, so that we can then better quantify what the changes are. Uh, further refining the definition of disruption, looking into route changes, uh, Cross-validate these results against data from the FloodNet team, uh, where you know they have a lot of sensors in Williamsburg in particular. Uh, does the data from FloodNet sensors there match up with what we see? Uh, and we hope to open source this code. And you know, uh, it's a rainy day today, and it's going to rain even more this afternoon. I think it'll be cool if tomorrow we can see what that meant for the transit system in New York City uh, and being able to see which areas were most impacted. Uh, that's the goal, maybe not for this year, but hopefully by next year. Um, that's the website. I'm Kaushik. Uh, my colleague, Canyon, who worked on this, is also here, but he's at another talk right now. Uh, so feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions and want to work with us on this, because we love to open source all our work. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Vaishali. This is Ashley. We're both from Beta NYC, and we'll be presenting FloodGen, which is a flood advocacy tool using AI-generated imagery. Um, I actually was a former associate at Beta NYC. Um, I worked there as a data analyst, and I started work on this project, and Ashley and the team have really taken it forward. And yeah, I'm excited to be back and presenting on it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Let's just dive right in. Yeah. Let's see. Um, I know we talked about this earlier this morning, uh, but we are Beta NYC. This is a project that was developed out of the Civic Innovation Lab branch of Beta NYC. Um, and we want to walk through, like, kind of this as an example of one of the, the projects that we do in the lab. Um, so we're really excited to launch this tool. Um, you can go to floodgen.beta.nyc to check it out yourself. Just a fair warning, we're, we're still like a bit in beta mode, so if you run into some bugs, like uh, we're working on it. <laughs> okay, so uh, 1.3 million people in New York City um, live within or directly adjacent to the floodplain. Uh, flood damage is expensive extensive, and oftentimes predictable. Yep. Maps of predicted flooding are helpful planning tools, but aerial views distance the viewers from its potential impact. If we show the reality of predicted flooding through photorealistic imagery, could people be more prepared? So this image right here, um, it was uh, generated using um, AI generative technology. Um, it takes a street view input and runs it through a technology called CycleGAN and recreates the pixels to render the flood um, in, in the view. So we have the ability to um, render the flood at various different height thresholds. So you could visualize minor flooding, moderate flooding, or major flooding. 
Um, but in launching this tool, uh, we really want to create awareness for communities who have not yet experienced flooding, create evidence for communities seeking resilience funding and projects. So some communities have received uh, um, repeated, have experienced repeated flooding, but they have not yet received the services to address those issues in their neighborhoods. Um, and then thirdly, we want to um, make this tool available to decision makers to respond and support advocacy efforts. Um, and Vishali is going to walk through the prototype. Um, yeah, so I'll take you through how we envision Fletcher the tool, how we aim to fulfill its ob objectives, which essentially strive to overcome the limitations of all the current tooling that we have. Um, okay, so what is Fletcher? It has two parts to it. It is an interactive web map where users can explore flood data and view AI-generated flood images of uh, street views in certain areas. Um, so I'm just going to give an example of how this is a screen recording from our website. So I wanted to show you how, how it looks like. If you see there is essentially a map with coastal flooding, you click on a point location and you can see. Uh, so yeah, you're zooming in, you're clicking on a point location um, and you can see how flooding looks like uh, at the street view level and you get a 360 degree view. Okay, so uh, you might be thinking, how did we actually even select these areas, these point locations? So our areas are prioritized based on a flood risk framework, which has three pillars. Uh, the first pillar being hazard. So are these areas susceptible to dangerous phenomenons like coastal flooding, stormwater flooding? Are these areas socially or economically vulnerable? That's the second pillar. And the third pillar is exposure. What are like the structures in these areas? Do these areas have assets that help with flood mitigation or not? Um, so these are the three pillars, and um, uh, you know I've shown this map previously, but it also has various layers that sort of fit within the flood risk framework. So if you look at the bottom left corner, you see the flood risk map layers, coastal flooding and stormwater flooding, which are essentially uh, hazards. Uh, there is a map about disadvantaged communities, communities that have been historically excluded from the conversation and haven't gotten the resources to mitigate floods. There is another map, the hurricane evacuation zones, which shows uh, which communities and which areas need to be evacuated quickly in terms of flooding. So that's another vulnerability. So overlapping all of these maps on top of each other essentially allowed us to do a little bit of like spatial analysis, which helped us select the areas where we would generate AI generated um, imagery. So we have the areas and we have these maps. So what can we do to move this forward? What can we do to help? So Ashley will talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so we have AI technology at our fingertips and it's really important to use that responsibly. So um, again, like our community engagement strategy was to select sites that really prioritize advocacy in, in this tool. So we don't yet quite have the ability to visualize like uh, a point let long location on the fly. So we really needed to just kind of push for a proof of concept um, and, and do like 10 case study sites. Um, so we are, again, prioritizing communities who have not yet experienced flooding, but are expected to. Um, communities that have seen repeated flooding, but need more advocacy support for resiliency services. And number three, like sort of the government agents and decision makers, uh, uh, for the people responding to these efforts. Um, again, we selected 10 case study sites throughout um, the city of New York. Um, and these uh, kind of were selected with that same risk flame framework. Um, and we uh, s selected the specific sites based on um, the flood risk exposure to nearby points of interest. So that includes nearby transit, public housing, hospitals, commercial areas, schools, and libraries. Um, so what can the tool do? So when you click on a point, um, you can see the AI generated image. Um, so you can toggle through, uh, select different sites and see that the images um, 
of what the streets would look like with different flooding levels. Um, you can toggle the buttons at the top to select the different thresholds of height flooding. So minor flooding is zero to four inches, moderate flooding is four to 12 inches, and major flooding is greater than one foot. Um, theoretically, like uh, you could also see kind of like similar to a Google Street View image, like a 360 view of that point. Um, so in our case, we kind of generated eight images that kind of rotate around. Um, so it's not quite a true 360, but it gets us close. Um, and then also it's like really important because we are using generative AI to like put these images forward into the world, into the public. Um, it's really important that we do this responsibly. Um, so we included on the website also this sort of disclaimer and like kind of a public education and awareness on how to identify that this particular image on our site is um, generated by AI. So there are a couple little pointers, like we include the logo at the bottom right corner of the image, um, there's like some blurred distortions. You can see when the water meets the cars or objects in the foreground, it's a little bit fuzzy. You might also notice that some of the, some of the photos have completely clear and blue skies, um, or there's this kind of clear stillness to the water. Um, usually there might be some debris or other realistic things. Um, so the image generator kind of like cleans all of that up. And the reason is to kind of like not instill fear into viewers, but really like try to visualize these projected flood scenarios. And I, I kind of like this surreal quality that keeps it a certain level of fakeness, um, which makes it clear that uh, it is not actually a real photograph. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit uh, of insight on how FloodGen works. So we have um, the concept of generative AI. Ashley's talked about it. You've probably heard it in association with ChatGPT, DALI, all of that. So it can develop realistic images of predicted flooding in streetscapes. And this right here is an example of a photograph that we would want AI to sort of emulate. Um, okay, so how do we do this? Um, we, to do this, we use an image-to-image -image transformation architecture known as the CycleGAN. And to achieve this image-to-image -image transformation, this is a very like rough sort of diagram, a uh, simplified diagram on how the CycleGAN works. So the CycleGAN sets up two types of AI models. The first model is called the generator, and it's responsible for creating transformed flooded images from a non-flooded image. Uh, the second model is known as the discriminator, and it acts as a critic, trying to distinguish between real and generated flood images. So the generator's job, which is the first AI model, its job is to try and outwit the discriminator by generating flooded images that are as close to ground truth as possible. Um, so that is how we get our realistic flood images. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this uh, is an example of the AI generated flood imagery. Uh, we had a model that we trained with stimulated and real data. We also built this model uh, about, uh, on, upon like an already existing model uh, known as the climate GAN. Uh, we had to train that model with some more cityscape views um, in order to make it more accurate, specifically for New York City. But you have an input, which is a non-flooded image, and you have an output, uh, which is a flooded image with floods of a certain height. Okay, so we have this knowledge of the capabilities of Gen AI and our precedent project. So again, coming full circle, this is how we envisioned our tool. We have a map that showcases different types of flooding and you know a few other lake flood risk layers. Uh, and then we have the user click on a specific vulnerable location on the map and see a 360 degree view of how different types of flooding, minor flooding, moderate flooding, and major flooding look like. Um, so this is just a pilot. Uh, we would love to be able to like develop an application where you can click any point location, 
read in the spatial data and then visualize the, the sort of LIDAR data um, with this projected flooding at any point location in New York City. Um, we only have, you know, 10 case study sites right now. We're looking for partnerships. We're looking for funding. Uh, we'd love to incorporate flood net data and other, you know, flood risk layers into this website as well. Um, we're moving in that direction. But again, the community advocacy strategy is sort of at the forefront. And we kind of want to get feedback um, from our partners, uh, from people who want to use this tool before we continue developing it further. So, you know, if there's any community uh, audience members in here, um, we would love to ask, you know, how do you think flood gen and generative AI can be, you know, most impactful to people? How do you think you, you could use this tool like flood gen? Um, and check out our website. Um, and we'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, so those were the three sessions. Uh, all three, I mean, I don't want to speak about myself, but super interested in flood gen, really excited to see the work that uh, Ricardo and, and his team are doing in terms of figuring out and mapping flooding uh, across the city. Uh, so yeah, uh, those are three sessions. Hopefully they were insightful. Uh, we still have maybe 10 minutes uh, before lunch. Uh, so if you're not so hungry and you're breathing, uh, you can ask us all questions. Yeah. I have a question for the first yeah. presenter, I think. Is, um, can, you, can you maybe like say, say a little bit about um, how decisions are made about where the sensors are located. Because I'm curious to know, you know, like you uh, put the map up there and I saw, say, like Sunset Park at Hunts Point do not have sensors, mm -hmm. like environmental justice community. So, like, what's, what's the impact of not having those sensors in environmental justice communities and how that impacts the accuracy of the predictions? Um, that's a super good question. <laughs> And it's what we grapple with a lot. So we look at ourselves as having three, three um, user, user bases, right? The first one is the city, obviously, uh, the city agencies. Um, the second one is the communities, and this is obviously anybody in the city. And the third one would be researchers like myself, right? Three, these are sort of our, our three, our three uh, constituencies. And uh, so we get requests uh, a lot from the communities, and we get a lot of requests from the city, which in many, time, many, many cases are also from the communities. And then we have like a triage process, and that really depends on um, the, the uh, availability of infrastructure to mount our sensors. That's, that's important. Um, and, and, and we also go through a, a, uh, an analysis which is similar to what um, the, the last uh, presenters, uh, Beta New York City presented. We have a exposure, risk, and susceptibility. Now, what we're finding, and this is really what is uh, something that we have to grapple with, is that uh, the information that can drive these things really depends on the representation of the communities. And a lot of these communities do not have the representation that others do. So, you know, communities where there are a lot of homeowners, they have a civic association who is very organized, they go out there, they, they make their case. Other communities, uh, especially where there are, uh, you know, uh, less economic development, um, they don't have that, and it's, us to, uh, it's, it's up to us to really seek these out. And that's really why we have a very active community engagement arm, trying to, trying to locate communities that might be represented by uh, churches, um, uh, immigrant organizations. Um, you know, th these are the ones that are hard to, hard to find, hard to engage with. Uh, so yeah, it's an ongoing project. Um, so I don't have an easy answer, but it's a, it's a mix of all these things. Yeah. Um, I just want to commend all the panelists for your really um, a strong focus on community engagement, advocacy, and centering your efforts there. Um, a lot of really great innovations. Um, since you are focusing so heavily on the communities and using quantitative data sets to aid in your development, what other kinds of data are you using, specifically qualitative data, and um, specifically the qualitative data generated by the community? Uh, we're not necessarily like using it, but we have talked to a group called the Community Flood Watch Project. Um, they gather like historic um, 
photos of like real flood scenarios in different communities. And part of their tool is also sort of gathering that like input or story telling aspect. So really like part of the community engagement is really the stories that and the memories that residents have and that they that really fuels the advocacy forward in their community. So they're going to fight for um, more resilience projects and things like that. So, I mean, that is definitely like a goal of like one of the conversations that we've talked about potentially integrating into our tool. It's a bit, it lends itself a bit on the qualitative side a bit more than the others, but <laughs> I'll let you two speak to that as well if you want to. Um, yeah, I mean, ours is, we are, you know, our, our objective and our goal is to make, you know, complex data easy to understand and easy to access. Uh, so really like our end goal, like if you go on Trek, for example, there are no numbers anywhere on the website. You don't need to understand uh, data. Like that's how we think about making analysis more accessible. Like you don't need to download a, a map and, and visualize complex layers. Like a lot of these data sets are extremely complex and very hard to use. And the way we think about it, and then through conversations with, uh, you know, community organizations working in this space, uh, not just in New York, but but across the country, is how do you take complex data and make it easy to understand so that they can very readily use insights from it uh, without, you know, uh, spending a lot of time trying to understand what uh, a value means. I saw you next, so come back. Yeah, yeah just um, a question. And this is more of a technical question. In terms of like generating how high the water level is through the AI, just kind of talk us through how that is calculated. Yes. Um, so there's actually uh, two parts to it. One is that the model itself contains a recipe folder. So it can figure out how close or far a certain image is, a certain part of it, the image is. Um, uh, based on that density model and we really generate water levels accordingly because when we see an image, it's essentially 2D. So certain yeah. height levels of the water need to be different. Then there's the second aspect to it is like flood levels themselves. Like sometimes there's excessive flooding, like major flooding, and then there's moderate and minor. I actually had a slide about that, but we cut it due to time. So we have uh, this uh, LiDAR data that allows us to essentially uh, get a mask from ground level. So we get a mask of a certain height. We superimpose that mask with our flood image. And then the pixels that are present in that mask are essentially there. And then the pixels that are not present in this mask are you know, deleted. So we get floods of certain heights. So we get depth perception, and then we get flood height. So hopefully that sort of answers the question. Now, the LiDAR data, is that coming from, uh, are you doing, actually doing these scans yourself? No, we're not. We oh, have a, it's from like Cyclorama. Oh, data Cyclorama. Okay. In New York City. Okay. Yeah. And it's like being straight, pretty much. Alright. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, this is all super awesome. I had a question for the first team. Um, whether you were looking at incorporating loss functions at all into your work and trying to understand, um, you know, the impact of these flooding events and how that might inform pardoning or um, manage retreat decisions. I'm going to ask Mike, who's our modeler, uh, to address that. So, so are you suggesting that um, are we doing things with our results that will advocate for you? Um, so, like, if there were a loss function, so that would translate the amount of severity to an estimated like amount of the building or property that's lost. Yeah. That would then like be fed into yeah. a I cost understand. benefit analysis. Yeah. So I would say um, right now, I, I, it's a great question, and a, a lot of the loss an, a loss analysis mm -hmm. in the Hurricane Sandy that was done on Staten Island has motivated us to choose the areas near the blue belt and it's motivated the city uh, to develop the blue belt in this, in this area. And um, right now, that's the, we're, we're doing the Midland Beach blue belt for you to South Beach blue belt, which hasn't been built yet. But that loss analysis was fundamental in the decision-making that the city did 
and others, uh, and insurance companies, for example, to understand where we should harden it. Um, the biggest hardening uh, piece of it is a seawall, which is uh, is going to be built along that whole uh, shoreline, running from like Great Kells all the way to South Beach, and that that. Uh, the original plans for that were done quite some time ago, but after Hurricane Sandy, there's been a whole new level of activity and the funding is coming, but it's not in place yet. Yeah. Um, uh, for the flood now, good question. So, from what I understand is you're able to get the flood height. Um, is there a limit on that height? Like, for example, nuisance flooding, if like it's very, very small scale flooding or very low flooding, not like a whole foot or something, so it's flooding that, or is the sensor still able to capture something like nuisance flooding? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, as a matter of fact, we kind of started on the nuisance uh, mm. flood problem and around Jamaica Bay. Uh, so our, our noise floor is about one inch, so, you know, on a good day, we can pick up one inch or just over one inch. Um, uh, yes, and that's to, to answer your question, is we, we've been working on that and it's available. Okay. Um, I just want to plug our website. Uh, uh, so if you go to floodnet.nyc, you can actually on that where, where you, you can you can see in real time or quasi real time the, the, and historical data of, of flood areas. Okay, on the Discussion about different countries' sets. Um, so it's kind of good with architecture. So, do you like talk enough with the data, um, like some kind of um, analogies, like in warehouses, star schemas, or do you just like kind of go off the wall data and you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, using a really useful model? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the end goal is to productionize this and, and create a, a robust pipeline. Um, GTFS real time is massive. Uh, looking at you know there are so many bus routes in, in New York City, uh, and this is just New York City. To expand to New York metro area, way more, uh, and this is one ping every minute for every bus. Actually, I think you can get like even higher resolution. The archive values are once a minute, uh, but I think real time you can get a ping from a bus every ten seconds. Uh, so definitely like scalable architecture and so on. So, you know, for this analysis for today, which is why we focused on like one week, the idea is to build a process that we can uh, every day or like say every hour run through, because they're independent. You can like do the analysis and calculate speeds on every route segment uh, for a day. And then how you put together is now a much simpler problem because you're broken down the thing into, these are route segments on this time, on this day of the week, uh, in this month, this is what the speeds were. And then you're looking at distributions and, and you're, you're working in like in, a, in the distribution domain rather than the raw data, uh, right. which simplifies it. Also has in the data set, also has you got to pick one or the other, and to kind of simplify and normalize the data, you got to pick one. I don't think I fully understand the question. Okay. Um, but the, the project is really a uh, very uh, impressive work. Uh, uh, my question is uh, that uh, when the AI generated the flood on the street, um, I know that probably the black box, uh, the algorithm they use, do you not consider like um, the, the elevations and the, the, the type of soil? Uh, uh, yes. or, or any like a uh, uh, drain, uh, storm, sewer, and uh, is any consider any of those issues? Yes, so we did train it on that kind of data and also the model that we built this on top of, mm -hmm. it did train it on that kind of data. That's why uh, we also have stimulated data, so specifically we could get data of like oh, drainage and stuff like that, but it's not for the drainage specifically. I think there are certain aspects of it, floods at certain heights, it does not generate those images. And in order to also make that black box more, um, like, you know, to actually see what's going on in that black box, they did have like the depth decoder and the segmentation decoder. So um, that would help us see that, okay, these are specific areas where we can generate the flooding aim. So you can see how the model was learning when it came to 
uh, sort of like getting water around a tree or like around a <coughs> fire hydrant or something like that. So it does have like these uh, different parts to it, which allow us to like make the black box more transparent instead of just data in and data out. Uh, again, but to answer your question, like the training needs to like sort of um, we need to train it with more like soil related and drainage related and stuff to make it more accurate. And is it interesting to uh, to know uh, if uh, you can uh, use the AI generated uh, street flood image compare with a real field folder photo of the street on the same events okay. and see if, if there's uh, how much difference that is? We actually did that for the September 20th <coughs> flooding. Yeah. There was a talk we gave we all did, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we're like, oh, well, how, how does this Very work? convenient. Yeah. Um, it was, it's a good, I think, at least put a few images. Of course, um, not for a lot, and the model has been trained since then. Check. But yes, that is a very good idea that we keep incorporating. We have done that once before, but I think we definitely do want I just want to say the, the point is not like hyper-realism either, because we can take photos for that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, really, like it's more a speculative tool, like for areas that are not yet prepared to deal with the flooding yet, or maybe there's an area you don't have the imagery for yet. So I think the generative AI kind of fills that void. And another avenue that like this predict sort of generative imagery could be useful is like uh, for weather forecasting, like if there's anticipated X inches of rainfall, maybe like when pairing it with like, you know, proper drainage calculations, we could say this is going to equal X height of flooding on the street. And this is what it might look like um, one day, you know, the so ultimate like, goal. Include right? that model with your, with <laughs> yeah. your product. So it doesn't need to be like hyper realistic, it doesn't need to be like 100% accurate either to like, communicate what it needs to do. Right. Last yeah. question. Thank you. Regarding the aftermath of a flood event in the city, what are the current pathways for repairs and damages that the individual homeowner or renter? Uh, is it the onus of the city to remediate damages, or is it an individual responsibility? Most of it is covered by insurance. So as a property owner, you would have insurance which covers flood damage. Um, at the city level, damage to city infrastructure would be different, obviously. Um, and I'm not the best person to speak about that. You ask a really important question. Yeah. It's a very, very important question. I mean, I say this because I, say this because I looked through Hurricane Sandy when many, many people on Scott Allen went through exactly that situation. And um, you know, FEMA, of course, plays a major role in terms of providing funding, and there's a, a, a lot of um, re requirements and rules in that regard. And uh, then, of course, you have flood insurance, which is very limited. People may think it's very broad and compensating. It's really not. It's very limited. Uh, so you have to kind of work through that. And during Sandy, New York City was very, very helpful. They, they put together um, a program for, for the city, for city people that were flooded out to have their homes rebuilt. Um, and I think it might be called Rebuilt by Design, or that might have been the name of it. And it was really effective if you got online early on in the process. Um, they replaced air conditioning systems and heating systems, the whole thing, and you could make the house that you could move back in. But that was a special program, so it was something that the city put together specifically to help. So that, uh, now, in general, I don't know if the city has any requirements other than if, if you could show negligence, but I, I, that didn't seem to be the way. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for this session. Um, and uh, we'll be hanging around. So if you want to catch us afterwards. But uh, I think lunch should be out. So uh, happy lunch.